we're going to look back over 50 years and see what camp was like in the very first years of operation. Actually, Camp Mac was established by my parents, Mr. and Mrs. E.A. McBride. And in 1948, my father bought an abandoned CCC camp in the Taldega National Forest with a dream of developing an outstanding summer camp for boys and girls in the Chiaha Mountains. In the beginning, there was really very little here. No ball fields, no lakes, no pool, no gym, not even a telephone line, and the only access to camp was an old dirt road. But there were a few living cabins and a dining hall and a recreation building and a few general purpose buildings and storerooms. Now let's take a trip back in time and see what camp looked like in the late 40s and early 50s. Here's a picture of the original rec hall. You can check out the big rock fireplace which is still there. The only thing left of this building today really is the uh, good oak floor that was refinished and it's still in place. Here we see my father, uh, Mr. McBride, having one of the first cabin inspections. Here are some of the first campers to ever attend camp and one of the first cabin inspections on the boys' cabin line. And over on the girls' cabin line, here are some girls uh, in their lounge room listening to the radio. And check out the lamp on the table there. The lamp was made in arts and crafts. Here are the rock steps in front of the rec hall. A little bit smaller than they are today, but I guess they were big enough. And check out the siding on the buildings there. There was a black siding with white strips. Not very attractive, but it did protect the buildings. Canteen has always been in the same place at camp, and here's some early campers enjoying ice cream in front of the canteen. I doubt that's bluebell ice cream, but they look like they're enjoying it just as well. Inside the canteen, we had uh, three or four different booths, and they were red and white. Here, a group of campers are enjoying their bottled soft drinks. Now, in 1955, um, I had completed my tour of duty in the United States Navy, and Margie and I returned home to camp. And here's Margie handing out mail in front of the dining hall. Back then, the camp was so small that you could have mail call just before we went in to eat each day at noon. And here's a shot inside the dining hall. See the serving line there. And notice that uh, the camp at that point was not large enough to even fill up one section of the dining hall. One of the first things my father did um, when he bought the camp was to build a swimming pool. There were very few swimming pools in the county at that time. Uh, they didn't have filter systems, so you had to fill the swimming pool up and, you, of course, you chlorinated the water during the week. And then once a week, you had to drain the pool and scrub it out like a bathtub. Check out the diving tower at the end of the pool down there. The campers love the diving tower. A lot of fun, but, of course, uh, insurance regulations don't allow that today. Because the need of a dependable source of water to fill the pool every week, my father was very interested in building the lakes here at camp. They built the lower lake first, and then just a couple of years later built the upper lake. Here's a shot of the upper lake before it filled up, and here we have the lake full. Oh, it was a big occasion when they paved the road coming through camp. Now delivery trucks would actually deliver groceries to the kitchen. And check out the uh, safari cabin over there at the left. Here's the first Camp Mac sign right at the entrance to the quadrangle. You see the wagon wheels marking the entrance to the dirt road around the quadrangle. I had a younger brother named John McBride who was an outstanding high school athlete. He lettered in three sports, basketball, track, football, and he accepted a scholarship to play football for the University of Alabama. In 1951, uh, and he played in the same backfield with Bart Starr. John had uh, just won the starting position uh, at halfback in his senior year, but was killed in a plane crash in 1954 while in training to be an officer in the United States Air Force. The marble marker in the quadrangle was placed there in John's memory by the members of the Air Force ROTC from the University of Alabama. And of course, the marker is still there today. The Vespa area at camp has always been in the same location. However, early on, the uh, stage was made of wood. 
Of course, the wood would rot from year to year, and eventually it was replaced with a concrete stage. And notice the trees, the young trees, trying to grow up between the seats, and eventually they had to be cut. And let's look at some of the activities in the early years at camp. Horseback was always popular. And here we have a picture of the first horses at camp. There were four horses for campers, and of course one of the counselors rode the lead horse. Now there really was no barn, just a, a mule barn over that, some property my father had bought. And there was no water, so the horses had to be watered at the lake. And every afternoon, late in the afternoon, some volunteers had to go over and ride the horses down to the lake and uh, let them have a good drink of water. First basketball court. This is on the location that um, is the beanbag battlefield today. You can notice a safari cabin in the background there. And look at that pole. Check out there's a string of lights, if you can look carefully, that the uh, staff uh, had rigged so that you could play at night. Uh, the lights weren't very good, but uh, it was one of the few things that you could do at night. Check out the swat ball court here. They had uh, cut a, um, a little tree and made a pole out of it and taken a tennis ball, put it inside a sock and tied a string to it, used wood paddles, and the rules were similar to tether ball, and this was really one of the uh, early games that led on to tether ball. Also, look at the tennis court back there. It's a dirt court and really we spent more time trying to line the court off than it did playing. And the chicken wire backstop behind it and across from the tennis court, there was a volleyball court. This was the first volleyball court and of course when it rained, you had two big mud puddles out there. And also the ball wound up in the ditch most of the time. Here's the first rifle range at camp. Rifery was one of the early activities, and it grew along the way. There was one firing position here, uh, but it was in the same location as the present rifle range, a good, safe location. Here's the first ball field at camp. Originally, there were no level places to play ball, so we had to cut these out of the hillside, you know, with bulldozers. But this is the uh, number one ball field. Uh, it's in the same place, of course, as today. And here's the first archery range. Looks like a pretty small target and also a pretty small camper there. This is in the location where the repelling towers are today. Horseback continued to be uh, popular and grew and now we've got a few more horses and um, the barn has been enlarged up there and this is the first riding ring. I guess arts and crafts has been moved around more than any other activity at camp. One of the early crafts buildings was right alongside the road um, next to the beanbag battlefield. And here's a shot inside with some of the crafts projects. In 1955, here's a shot of square dancing in the rec hall. Square dancing was very popular. There was square dancing nearly every night in the rec hall. And check out the deer head down there above the piano. Now back in those days, school started after Labor Day. So that left a couple of weeks after camp was over, and um, quite often high school bands came out and had a band camp as they practiced getting ready for the football season. Here's the summer of 1957, and Margie and Allen are right outside the canteen, always one of their popular places. Also in 1957, here are the king and the queen and the runner-ups for party night. Here's Allen getting ready for his first campfire and the campfire uh, area as the campers come in. And you notice the torches there that they led them to the campfire area with. In 1957, uh, war night was held over in the little theater building. And here's my father, Mr. McBride, with some of the top awards. In 1958, there was a very severe winter. It was so cold that both lakes froze over. And here's uh, Allen testing out the thickness of the ice, upper lake right off the end of the ski dock. It uh, seems to be holding him up pretty well there. Here's a picture of some of the first CITs. Ernie Strong, the gentleman right there on the end, was the first CIT director at Camp Mac. And in fact, he uh, designed and authored the um, CIT diploma that we still use today. This uh, actually is not a picture of the first group of CITs. It's just the oldest picture that I could find. 
This is from 1967, and you can notice that um, there are about uh, four boys and five girls in this picture. Uh, Ray Bean was one of the um, assistant CIT directors. He's on the end. So a total of nine CITs in that particular picture. Ernest um, did a great deal to um, uh, help the camp program along with his uh, expert leadership, and uh, his contributions will always be remembered. Party night in 1959 was in the rec hall, and square dancing still popular here. And in 59, again, some of the top awards with my father there. And check the old uh, deer head there looking down on everybody. It's still in place. The first canoe dock was on Upper Lake, actually, uh, right in the place that there's a boathouse now. And uh, check out the canoes. Those are wooden canoes. They call them tipper canoes. And I think that was because they tipped over so easy. Here's the first water basketball goal, 1959, in the swimming pool. And also a big construction project in 59, the concrete tennis court. And really it was an all-purpose court because we had basketball goals on either end. Uh, you could rig the uh, volleyball net in the middle and even had a shuffleboard court at one end. Um, this was just a, a tremendous asset because for the first time we had an all-weather court that you could play on uh, in the afternoons after a shower of rain. And back in those days, the barber came out to camp uh, every other week and cut all the boys' hair at camp. Now, there was a lot going on in the uh, 60s um, at camp, and so let's talk a little bit about the 60s. I have a new camp sign here uh, on the ox yoke at the entrance to camp, and as a matter of fact, the same old ox yoke is still in use today, even though several different signs have hung from it during the years. And in front of the dining hall, we have a new concrete patio out front and shelters along the side to shelter people from the rain. And here's the first badminton court uh, right there by the canteen, same location as today. And later on in 61, uh, the badminton court was surfaced with concrete. And look, there's a new building, a white building right behind there. This was the first ping pong building in camp. Now, this is now part of the canteen operation, but then it was our ping pong building. And shuffleboard moved over right next to ping pong, and now you could play tennis and shuffleboard at the same time. Riflery continued to grow. We've doubled in size. Now two people can shoot at the same time on the rifle range. I believe that's Don McLemore, one of the um, early counselors at camp, his riflery instructor. And the first pool trampoline was installed in 1961, and that's a still popular thing today. Here's John on his favorite horse in 61. And, of course, camp continued to grow with uh, horseback being one of the popular activities. We're up to 12 horses now in 1965, actually. And skiing became more and more popular. Skiing was growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, and here you see um, a couple of the ski instructors um, with a whole bunch of skis. These are wooden skis, and actually they were Cypress Garden skis. Those were considered to be the very finest uh, skis. They were all wood, and they planed off easy. And even our youngest campers got into skiing. This picture is of a little eight-year-old girl. I do not remember her name, but she was one of the youngest campers to learn to ski. And she's up and away there and doing such a good job, I bet she could ski behind a mouse boat. Speaking of skiing, here's a group practicing for the ski show on Parents' Day. And the camp has a new ski boat here, and it's powered by an Evinrude Big Twin, the largest engine made, outboard motor made, and it had all of 25 horsepower, and it's pulling four skiers. Here's a better shot of the little ski boat and the 25 horse motor. If you look carefully, you can see the camper in the back uh, practicing for the ski show, and he's riding a rocking horse. There was a big snow in January of 62. About six inches of snow covered all of the camp. Beautiful sight. And here's what the swimming pool looked like with six inches of snow. And here's the upper ball field. Check the depth of that snow on the bench there. 
If camp had been in session, we could have had snow skiing for an elective. Also in 62, the first trampolines came to camp. This was an immensely popular activity with the campers, and of course trampolines is still a popular activity today. Here's a neat picture of my mother and father and Alan and John in the first electric golf cart at camp. My father's health uh, beginning to fail, and he used the golf cart to get around camp. Of course, the camp continues to grow, and the steps in front of the rec hall have been enlarged now. And um, this was in, still in 62, and the first radio program at camp was held uh, and conducted in 1962. Check out the uh, little 45 RPM record changer. This was the leading edge of technology back in those days, and that was a central part of the music system. Electronics was an unusual camp activity, and um, it began uh, in 1960s early and uh, ran for a number of years. And here people actually made kits from parts. They soldered the parts together and made amplifiers and intercom sets and radios and so forth, and of course took them home. They had to discontinue the elective a number of years later because things uh, were all went to transistors and integrated circuits and uh, they weren't made up uh, by soldering parts together one at a time. Another um, activity, elective, that was new then was cheerleading. And this was offered for several years until the interest dropped. Here's party night in 1962. And that year we had a live band at party night and here's Alan and John are posing in front of the band. 63 was a big year for camp um, because a gym was built in that year. Now all of the trees, the lumber for the gym uh, were cut from trees right around camp here on campgrounds. A local sawmiller named Clyde Gunner uh, cut the lumber into the right sizes and lengths to build the gym. A uh, hardwood floor was uh, installed and this was so much better than the concrete the campers thought they'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> 